Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we've got another edition in our World War II Naval Battles in the Pacific series. This one is on the Battle of Vela Gulf. Vela Gulf happened in uh, August of 1943, uh, specifically on the night of the 6th to the 7th of August. And this uh, battle was part of an ongoing series that took place in the Central Solomons following the uh, series of naval battles that took place around Guadalcanal in late 1942 uh, in the Southern Solomons. So the Allies at this point have secured Guadalcanal, they've moved their way up the Solomon chain, uh, and, and now they're fighting in the Central Solomon Islands. The Japanese Navy is trying to resupply and reinforce its bases there, and they're using fast destroyers to do this so they can run in at night uh, before American air cover can get there. So the United States has been attempting uh, for close to a year at this point to stop the Tokyo Express, the, this force of destroyers that is able to reinforce the Japanese positions. Um, and up until this point, they were throwing their heaviest expendable ships, the treaty cruisers, uh, into the fight to uh, try and win naval supremacy. Uh, the U.S. military did not put uh, heavy doctrine on torpedoes. Uh, in fact, their heavy cruisers did not have torpedoes, while all of the other major powers did. Uh, so the U.S. Navy ships intended to use gunfire to win these battles. Uh, these battles all took place at night because that's when the Japanese were reinforcing. Uh, so as soon as any American ship opened fire with its guns, its position was immediately visible. So even though the Americans had uh, superior sensing technology in their radar systems, which the Japanese still couldn't match at this point in the war, uh, they were still revealing their position, and uh, as, as soon as their position was revealed, the Japanese could launch their extremely effective torpedoes uh, and knock the American ships out of action really quick. So for the past year, the United States Navy just hemorrhaged almost every cruiser in the Pacific. Uh, they, they were down to hardly enough to escort all of the new aircraft carriers that were coming out. So uh, finally, the U.S. Navy stopped committing cruisers to this fight. So after the uh, prior nighttime naval battle of Kolombangara, which ended in a sort of qualified Japanese success, the Americans decided to send in their patrol torpedo boats, the PT boats, also nicknamed mosquito boats. Uh, they're made out of plywood. They're about 45 tons each. Uh, and each one carries four torpedoes and some light machine guns. Uh, so a force of these uh, PT boats were sent in to try and uh, stop the Japanese destroyers, and uh, it, it was ineffective. They didn't score any torpedo hits. Uh, they took some casualties, and... Uh, the torpedo boat commanded by future President John F. Kennedy was rammed accidentally by the Japanese and sunk, and uh, Kennedy was stranded on a deserted island with uh, his surviving PT boat crew. Uh, at the time of the Battle of Vela Gulf, he is still awaiting rescue. So, having failed to win with heavy cruisers early in the campaign, having failed to win with fast-firing lighter cruisers at Kolombagara, having failed to win with PT boats, uh, the Navy finally does what the Japanese have been doing all along, and they turn their destroyers loose. Uh, so they are aware that the Japanese are going to make a Tokyo Express run on the night of the 6th and 7th of August, so they send in a force of six destroyers. They also correctly estimate that the Japanese are going to use the same route that they have been using uh, for over a month at this point. 
even though the Japanese admiral commanding the force recommended they take a different, longer route, uh, the threat of American aircraft and uh, the risk of burning more fuel, which the Japanese are having trouble producing faster than American submarines can sink their tankers, uh, causes them to order him to take the same route that he has been taking. So this American destroyer force, which is by now fairly combat experienced in nighttime fighting uh, and has the more reliable SK type surface search radar that can now distinguish a little bit better between land masses and ships. Uh, they go into combat and they have a plan. They've actually worked together and they've trained together and they know how nighttime fighting works at this point. Uh, so finally, after a year and a half of uh, fighting in World War II, the US Navy is ready to fight the Japanese Navy at night on relatively equal terms. So the Japanese send in a force of four destroyers. Uh, these destroyers are all carrying troops and supplies. And uh, none of these destroyers have any radar or radar detection equipment. Uh, in a previous nighttime battle in the area, the Japanese had been able to detect the Americans based on the electronic signature of their radar. Uh, the, these four destroyers that they're deploying do not have that, and so for like the first time ever, the U.S. Navy is able to catch the Japanese completely unawares and off guard, uh, despite their superior nighttime optics. So the six U.S. destroyers are commanded by uh, Frederick Moosberger, and uh, He's a commander at this point. He will later be promoted all the way up to vice admiral. Uh, and he is a destroyer guru uh, with a fair amount of experience by this point. He has uh, six destroyers. They're all more or less the same class. Three of them still have their full pre-war uh, designed torpedo battery of eight tubes. And three of them have lost four of their torpedo tubes in exchange for heavier anti-aircraft batteries. So uh, these torpedo tubes are better for sinking the Japanese destroyers. The heavy anti-aircraft batteries are better for dealing with uh, the barges that the Japanese would use to offload uh, their supplies. So Moosberger divides his force of six ships uh, based on what torpedoes they have and he takes the three that still have eight torpedo tubes each, uh, and he goes along the coast of Kolombangara, which blocks out the silhouette of his ship so the Japanese can't see him. He has the other three destroyers with the heavier guns go, uh, his destroyers are going this way along the coast, they go the other way uh, at a 90 degree angle essentially, so they can cover the torpedo force with their guns. The Japanese would be coming up parallel to the American force in the opposite direction. Uh, so his gunboats are crossing the T of the Japanese destroyers. And if the Japanese destroyers notice the American ships or their torpedoes and try to turn away, they can't turn towards Kolombangara because they'll run aground, so they'd have to turn away. Well, then they're perfectly broadside to the American gunboats, which can then launch their torpedoes. Uh, while Mooseburger's three ships have crossed the Japanese Sea and can cover with gunfire. So it's a pretty effective strategy, um, and it ends up working perfectly. About 11.30 at night, the U.S. destroyers pick up the Japanese destroyers on their radar, right where they're supposed to be. Uh, the American destroyers get into position to fire their torpedoes, uh, the group of uh, three under Mooseberger that are actually using their torpedoes fire all 24. Uh, and then they hold their fire so they don't reveal that they're there. And they agree beforehand that they're not going to fire any of their guns until the torpedoes hit. So that they don't reveal their position until that point. Uh, and believe it or not, the strategy that the Japanese have been using since pre-war days 
works perfectly. They score hits on all four Japanese destroyers. Uh, three of the destroyers are disabled outright. Uh, Shigori is hit in the rudder, and it is uh, a thin enough structure that the torpedo passes straight through without the detonator being armed. So Shigori is able to beat feet out of there uh, pretty effectively. The other three destroyers are more or less dead in the water and now caught in a crossfire between six American destroyers. Uh, so after the torpedo hits, they're, they're now burning and their position is pretty well revealed. The American destroyers open fire with their guns and sink all three of those vessels. The, uh, I should also note that by this point in the war, the American Mark 15 torpedoes, which have been unreliable at best up to this point because of their detonators, um, have finally been fixed. So all of the torpedoes detonate when they hit a structure strong enough to set them off. So this combination of using the destroyers on their own as opposed to tying them down to the cruisers, which are more valuable, and then force the destroyers to protect the cruisers instead of going out and launching their attacks, um, works perfectly. The Japanese do not land a single hit on the American ships. There's a single casualty uh, when an American gunner is uh, injured, crushed by some component of the five-inch guns as they're loading, uh, which, which is a manual operation that requires a bunch of guys to know their job really well. Uh, even on Battleship New Jersey, there were injuries with uh, people loading the guns. So that's not a surprise. It's, it's kind of unavoidable. The American destroyers, having won this great victory, um, are said to have offered to pick up the Japanese sailors and soldiers who were in the water, uh, and the Japanese uh, did uh, did not accept the offer and chose to remain in the water. Uh, I'm not sure how much I believe that. By this point in the war, there were war crimes being committed by both sides. It's not uncommon to, in the Pacific War, to hear stories of uh, either American or Japanese ships machine gunning survivors in the water. Uh, at worst, at, at best, oftentimes you don't stick around to wait for them because there's the possibility that there's enemy submarines or other enemy warships around. Uh, so even though the Americans said that they offered to pick up the Japanese, I'm not 100% convinced that's what happened. Um, that said, the Japanese are surrounded by islands in all directions. Uh, and it does go against the Bushido Code, which many soldiers followed, um, to be captured, especially when they could fairly easily swim to an island that is controlled by the Japanese and then do their actual job defending that island. Uh, so, you know, there's the chance that this is true. The American destroyers did stop and offer to pick Japanese survivors up, and the Japanese just didn't uh, accept in any event, uh, despite all the islands nearby, land masses can be deceptively far away, and um, well over a thousand Japanese soldiers and sailors from these ships were either killed in the torpedo and gunnery hits on the three destroyers that were lost, or uh, drowned trying to swim to land. Uh, some of the survivors did make it to land, uh, on Kolombangara, which at this point is being effectively blockaded now that the Americans know to just use destroyers and torpedoes uh, and how to use them effectively. Uh, and so the Japanese, uh, the Americans decide not to invade Kolombangara proper and they just bypass it in their island hopping campaign. And the Japanese choose to um, pull their troops out of there since they can no longer resupply them. And so any of the survivors from 
this battle are pulled out as well. This is far from the last battle in this part of the world that's going to take place, but it is a real turning point in Americans' tactics and, and thinking. And now they have some really experienced destroyer squadron commanders who are going to be taken off the leash and uh, turned loose. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section down below. Have any of you served on destroyers? Do we have any tin can sailors watching? Let us know in the comment section. If you would like to support our YouTube channel and the content we're creating, consider checking out the description below for ways you can support our channel and our museum. Um, in particular, there's a link down there to the GoFundMe page we have, uh, and any donations you make on that go directly into uh, creating more YouTube content. We do try to create several pieces of content a week. Uh, so if you are interested in seeing more of this type of content, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.